Welcome back to day two of Createc, the stage where creativity meets technology at the COGEX Virtual Festival for AI and Breakthrough Technologies. It's exciting to be part of the biggest, most inclusive and forward-thinking gathering of leaders, CEOs, entrepreneurs, policymakers, artists, academics and activists of its kind. I'm Janet Hull and I represent the UK Creative Industries Council, a community of leaders who together seek to safeguard, support and promote the UK creative industries, both around the UK and on the global stage. I'm your MC for Createc and I'm here to help you navigate the spectacular three-day program we've helped prepare for you. This is our first year at COGEX and our fourth year of running Createc. And we're delighted that although we're the new biz at COGEX, we're already the second most popular stage with over 800 registered to participate, 30% of them from outside of the UK. We'd love to be the number one. So if you enjoy what you see, Please share the details with your friends. Our Create Tech topic code to access a three-day festival pass is still active during the festival. COGEX is all about community. And if the creative industries is the community you want to belong to, just email us at createch at thecreativeindustries.co.uk and we'll make sure to keep you involved. Please hashtag your appreciation of Createch too using hashtag createc and cognitionx2020. You'll see that our program is compiled in 45 minute sessions with entertainment intervals of 15 minutes, but there are also some gaps. We're on at 10 till 11 and again at 12 till one. We're on two till four, then again five till seven. In those gaps between programming, we'll be encouraging you to explore beyond our stage to the Createc Expo area, where you can meet and greet our speakers and contributors and network with your peers. And of course, there are other stages you might want to explore too. The overall theme of COGEX this year is how do we get the next 10 years right? And for us in the UK creative industries, that means how do we invent, master and manage the new world where creativity meets technology? Stay with us to find out. The Createc stage is hosted by the Creative Industries Council and supported by Facebook, UKRI, Moore Kingston Smith and Digital Catapult. We had an amazing day yesterday, hearing from Tim Davey, Chair, Creative Industries Council and CEO, BBC Studios, Carolyn Dinnidge, MP, Minister for Digital and Culture, both setting out their vision for the creative industries. We launched the Createc 100 Ones to Watch, and showcase many of these excellent newborn companies on our stage and in the Createc Expo booth. We debated the challenges and opportunities surrounding emerging tech, the metaverse, explored funding for R&D and innovation, discussed finance for startups and scale-ups, and explored the digital future of art, AI in entertainment, and living through fiction. We have another packed agenda for you today and look forward to sharing it with you. First up, how do we get the next 10 years right for UK television? As Silicon Valley upstarts and legacy media companies do battle over our screens, where is it all heading? Isolation at home has increased hours of viewing exponentially. How is UK television innovating? How are UK audiences responding? What's happening on the global stage? What's next for UK production? Due to technical difficulties, I'm sorry to say that Claire Enders, our moderator for this session, has not been able to join us. But we're delighted that Wayne Garvey, President Sony Pictures Television, has taken her place. Over to you, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yes, uh, we're, we're here. We're, we're living a real COVID experiment because we are we have been self-isolated now from our parent, uh, which is Claire Enders. And so now you have a, a, a panel who are going to run free. I, I'm Wayne Garvey. I'm president of uh, Sony uh, International Production, overseeing productions uh, around the world, in the UK, everything from The Crown to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire to White Lines, Sitting in Limbo and Alex Ryder. 
I'll be talking a little bit about how we are moving back into production uh, across the world. But first of all, let's meet my fellow panelists. First off, Andrea, are you there? Hi, from Rome, Italy. Um, so ah, I'm Andrea Scusati. You can introduce yourself. Yeah. So I'm Andrea Scusati. I'm um, and CEO of Fremantle, that uh, is one of the leading independent producers of content in the world. So we're operating around uh, more than 30 territories uh, producing, and um, we do shows that go from uh, uh, big talent shows and uh, entertainment shows like The X Factor, Joe Talent, uh, Idol, to scripted and uh, factual shows, a little bit across all the world. Nice to have you on board. And our second friend is Rima. Rima, are you there? Introduce yourself, please. I'm here. Hi, Wayne. Hi, Andrea. Hello, everybody. Uh, Hi. I'm Rima, Rima Sakan. Uh, I'm Chief Brand and Creative Development Officer for Britbox Global, uh, and I'm also ITV's Group Director for SVOD, which basically means I look after uh, the SVOD interests wherever they are. Uh, and that's mainly Britbox, uh, UK, uh, US, Canada, uh, and our upcoming uh, launch into Australia. Um, I spent probably about a decade at the BBC working in public service and nearly that uh, over at ITV uh, in kind of marketing and strategy roles. And so, uh, yeah, kind of one of the founding architects of the Brickbox idea uh, and how we kind of take it on. So let's talk about, let's kick off by talking about Brickbox, which is we're talking about innovation in the future. Actually, it's one of the most exciting things that's happened to the UK television industry over the last uh, few years. It's both global and uh, based in the UK. Uh, how's it going? Uh, I mean, it's going really well. Uh, and I would probably say, you know, the only new thing about Brickbox is actually getting it to market and getting it out. Uh, some of the more seasoned uh, members of our industry will remember that the PSBs for some time have been trying to work together in partnership to create an over-the-top streaming service, probably many scarred from uh, Kangaroo, which is over a decade ago, and sort of the uh, demise of that, uh, I'd say, kind of opened up uh, the UK as a really fertile space for OTT without any really significant uh, UK presence. I think it left um, quite a lot of the British creators and, and broadcasters certainly with their fingers burnt, and so getting back into bed with each other and doing something bold and brave uh, in this space, I think took us a fairly long time until about 2017, um, uh, when we launched Brickbox in the US. Uh, again, a really bold uh, and brave thing to do, albeit the largest media market in the entire world, uh, a fiercely competitive one, uh, uh, but one that we knew if we could earn our furs in would be great proof of concept. Uh, for Britbox uh, as a proposition, and really to help uh, what were two uh, quite traditional um, broadcast and studio organisations learn the mechanics of subscription video, subscription management, subscriber management, and the entire sort of direct-to-consumer world. Um, uh, so uh, I shipped over there actually uh, back in 2017 to help with uh, the acceleration of that, launched us out in Canada. Um, and, you know, it's been an amazing experience and a fantastic success. And I think, you know, a credit to two things that I think are really important. One, that uh, we absolutely, as an industry, have the right to earn our place on the global stage within streaming and OTT as a kind of UK creative and uh, industry. And in fact, we may have been just a little bit too British about it in the past, thinking maybe maybe it was all you know something that we didn't quite uh, understand and the domain of you know uh, the big tech giants um, but what it really taught us is that with a very clear and distinctive opposition a really pointy uh, point of difference that clearly we do something different uh, we create something different and we're known for something different um, and then if you match that with the sort of biggest rights armory that you can get your hands around, uh, it's a really great formula for success. Uh, so what that required is collaboration between the BBC and ITV, which again, uh, in and of itself, sort of architecting that and realizing it's kind of the enemy out there, not the one in here that uh, we need to be focused on winning against, uh, has really been a fantastically positive experience. 
um, the UK, the US and uh, Canadian business is now uh, just over three years old. So we're still babies in this space. Uh, it's doing brilliantly. We announced over a million subscribers back in uh, spring. Uh, the, U the UK we launched in November, so it's six months old, very, very uh, early into its life, but doing brilliantly well. You know, both or, both annoyed uh, quite significantly by the increased demand within SVOD, which sits on top of uh, the already significant shift in terms of viewer choice and viewer behaviour. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've got our eyes set on uh, where next. We've announced that we're launching in Australia. Um, and so uh, we're busy uh, doing that at the moment with uh, no travel and uh, doing that based out of London and New York and uh, various teams, which has been a lot of fun. Um, uh, but but going really well, researched brilliantly, and we're really excited. Um, so I think, you know, a massive market, that's probably what it's fair to say, you know, $100 billion by 2024. We don't need to beat or uh, be like Netflix or uh, be like Disney to be able to create a great business and fund really, really significant money back into uh, UK creative and UK programming. Uh, I think that's the dynamic that everybody loves to create. It's like, well, can you ever beat Netflix? I know, and why would we? Uh, you know, we're a brilliant addition if you love that way of watching and you like different programming that you may not find. Uh, on either Netflix or Disney or HBO Max or the, the kind of global players, which arguably are very much competing uh, on it within the same space. Uh, and, and that space is getting really hot. I mean, the last six months has seen sort of seismic change there, uh, you know, particularly within, within the US. But as yet, we haven't seen that diminish in terms of uh, overall appeite. So, um, uh, and we are in... Unbelievably strange things in terms of that being there. So we'll see what happens. Um, but it's a good place to be at the moment. So why don't you show us uh, what the service looks like? Because there may be people tuning in here who haven't seen it. Sorry, yes. As I said, we're only six months old. Some people may not know or have seen uh, BritBox. So I've got a little ad from, I think it's the UK. You can play that. Binge on British with BritBox, the biggest box of British box sets, and now even bigger with Channel 4 and so much more. From comedy to crime, drama to documentaries, stream the latest hit shows, undiscovered gems, plus loads of exclusives. From the BBC, ITV, Channel 5, and now Channel 4. All together, all in one place, ad-free. Search for BritBox free trial. <laughs> I think that's 30 seconds. Oh. <laughs> we're live we're live again. So thank you for that. Are you I mean presumably Fremantle like us at Sony welcome Britbox. We 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 we've got a couple of projects that we're excited about that we're that we're in pre-production on. Who knows when we'll get we'll talk about that later. I mean yeah. as a producer you welcome any kind of platform, presumably. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, uh, look, obviously the, the simple answer is more, more competition, more uh, opportunity for, um, is, is great. But I would say this is not only from a um, purely commercial point of view, it is uh, really, I think for, for the creative community, uh, knowing that um, when you, you are in a situation where you can create something in a um, true, um, freedom uh, because then you will look to find the right home for it uh, it's it's a fundamental component of our job and and the more homes there are the more uh, diversity there is in the potential um, outlets that will then um, you know host that content the better it is for a creative community and I mean, one of the issues we find as producers, of course, is is the different models, the rights positions in country is a different model. And now, of course, we're finding as, as platforms come on stream, they have different requests, different, and and the world changes very quickly, doesn't it? We we, we used to have a different form of windowing and, and so on. How do you see uh, that, both of you, how do you see that progressing in the next uh, 10 years? Well, that's 10 years is far too, in 10 years time, well, I'll be retired. Uh, 
you see Andrea, you'll be on a beach somewhere. But, um, you know, how do we see this five years going? Well, I mean, uh, uh, it's a re I think it's, act it's the accurate question and it's a really complex one. And actually, it just requires a great deal more sophistication in uh, in rights management and the trial of lots of ideas. I think it is really contextual. If I think about the US business where um, Britbox is a very standalone service, doesn't really have any linear channel windows that it is the brother or sister of or feeds off of or any cross promotion uh, from. And so it's, you know, it uses its premieres very heavily to uh, drive people into the service. You know, in the UK or other markets where it has relationships with linear channels and also if you look to the US where you know I don't know something like AMC has its SVOD um, uh, services in relationship to its linear channels it uses those to create fame and hits and then drive people into OTT through exclusivity or, or windowing and I don't think there is a single silver bullet in terms of a defined model that works I think there's a ton of opportunity you know Anecdotally, Netflix will talk to us about, you know, shows that they have on that, you know, create huge spikes when they're back on TV uh, and that can drive viewing. So is it all about exclusivity? Is it about famous franchises? Is it about windowing that really sort of um, jumps off of awareness points or popular culture points? You know, it's, it's a new alchemy, I think, of all of that. Uh, but I think you're right, sort of being able to hedge which rights bundle you should be taking to say that's the one that's going to work is really, really difficult, uh, which is where, you know, traditionally, you know, it'll be 10 years all rights globally, you don't have a say. And I think, I don't know, Wayne, you know, your perspective on this would be really interesting and Andrea, producers thought that was great, but actually then your show is locked away in a cupboard and may not get the exposure it needs. And then kind of can wither on the vine, whereas actually exploitation of shows can give them new life and then you know lead to new things. So yeah, I, I don't know that there is there is silver, but there's a lot of creative opportunity. We, we, we've we've just done an interesting experiment that kind of went live this week. Actually, we for the first time ever uh, fully funded a series. Bef rather, the yeah. traditional model is to go to a broadcaster and do them. We. We took a gamble on a show called Alex Ryder, which is based on Anthony Horowitz's books. And because we were concerned about how do we continue to retain rights, we make a lot of shows that we sell to the streaming services. We love our relationship. We make The Crown for Netflix and White Lines and so on. Um, but actually, how do we retain rights? And how do we think about the longevity and how can we control the possibilities of a franchise going forward? So Alex Ryder is interesting because it debuted this week in the UK so it seems to be doing really, really well on Amazon. And then there's going to be a progression around the world. We've sold it in over a hundred countries. I think that might be a model that we would, uh, we would look to do again. Now, Andrea, I don't know whether you've had those kind of conversations with Fremantle. No, absolutely. Look, I think um, I agree. I think first of all, there's, I mean, it wasn't even in the past, but the time where there's one model that fits all is completely gone. I think um, you know you you have to explore several different models. Uh, you have to be open-minded about different models, um, but also you have to be constantly willing to innovate and take risks uh, because uh, look, the, the the world will change constantly. And um, look, I think all of us and some of the people following us remember when. Um, in the movie business for like 40 years, there was this kind of a windowing system that was, you know, you, you couldn't debate about it. I, I remember literally when I was at Sky before joining Fremantle, I was there for, for, for more than 10 years. And I remember discussing with the US studios and they literally, they said, this will never change. There's no way it will change, okay? There is, you know, there's theatrical, then there is, you know, pr premium, physical until Blockbuster was there, then okay, okay, there's not no DVDs anymore, but it's still, you know, in transaction and so on. And um, and look what happened in the last two months. I mean, it, it was happening before, obviously, but the last two months show that movies actually could do, and I'm not saying it's 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 the solution for everything, and I'm not even saying it's anyway, I still hope I will be able to watch a movie on a big screen, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but frankly a couple of movies did a lot of money. 
going directly in you know in a transactional uh, environment with a premium transactional window and um, and that shows that um, we have to, uh, you know as an industry and because we're discussing today how to get it right in 10 years i don't think like i i certainly don't have the the specific answer of how to get it right but i i do think that one way not to get it wrong is to be available always open to challenge the status quo, always open to start challenge what is the kind of industry standard, because there's no industry standard that will survive forever. It's, it's, it's about, it's us that will change that industry constantly, you know? And, um, and if you don't change, you just get residual. Um, do, do you think you need unbelievably deep pockets to be able to do that? I mean, you know, Sony. I don't look. I don't. I don't think that's, yeah, it's, it's part, no, I don't think that's the case completely because I, I think, mm -hmm. look, uh, it, it is inevitably a portfolio approach. Mm -hmm. So if you are a, a big, a medium-sized company uh, that you have the luxury of be working on several projects at the same time, um, you, 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 the right thing to do is have a portfolio approach. You have a component of projects that go directly to streamers, where you know, as Wayne was, you know, referring some of their diagram shows to Netflix. But you have a components that go to linear broadcasters. You have a components where you studio deficit. You have a component where you partner with the creative. The other thing I think that the other thing that will happen, I'm pretty sure, is I think we can all agree that especially probably in the US and partially in the UK, some of the talent deals and overall deals and exclusive deals have been done in the last years were inflated, that's an understatement. I mean, there was a lot of PR there. People wanted to get a big line saying they had signed exclusive somebody, but the, the, the money that was attached was completely, they had no logic, okay? Um, so, so this event, I think one of the effects will be, will we'll bring some more rationality in that kind of deals. Uh, but that doesn't mean, I think, that the answer is to go to a talent and say, I'm sorry, I'm gonna offer you half of what you know, was being offered a month ago. Yeah. That means you have to go to a talent and say, let's build together a different kind of deal where you have skin in the game, where you are an entrepreneurially involved mm -hmm. in this. But if you want to be an executive producer, um, apart from being a writer, you have to have an entrepreneurial approach. And that means that if your project is successful, you have to be, you have to get you know, the benefit of that. If it's not successful, you get less. You cannot get you know, best of both worlds. And, and that will be a model where, you know, again, good projects will be very, very profitable for everybody involved in the value mm -hmm. chain. And projects that are not very good, everybody will lose. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it goes back to betting on the right projects, really. Yeah. Yes. But I also think, you know, where do producers and creative talent want to take their shows? And, I mean, it would be great to get your perspective on it because, you know, there was a while, as you say, it's not just the checkbook although that was pretty compelling but you know all these nurtured great UK creatives suddenly sort of ejected and, and it was a kind of a preferred way of working and I think you know whether it's UK commissioning companies organizations channels SVODs whatever kind of failed if we weren't the place that uh, yeah. the, that talent would take their ideas. Well I, I think a lot of this is to do with budgets of course isn't it mm -hmm. whether you, you have the funding available to make that their vision come true. And, and this is some of the problem that some of the free to air broadcasters have now. So you're really going to have to partner up with people. And, and we don't quite know how free to air broadcasters around the world are going to come out of COVID. They're, 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 you know, there's not one who isn't struggling at the moment. Um, but I, I think you're right. Finding that right partnership. And, and you, you, to Andrea's point, many of these people who signed up to these big unbelievably rich deals are frustrated because they're selling to one buyer who is saying well actually i don't like this particular show and it tends to be something they and they can't go anywhere with it and yeah. that is look, I, again, I, 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 look i worked for a pay television for 12 years and and frankly and and, and the, pay, the pay television objective very correctly very correctly is to cater to its subscribers Okay, mm -hmm. they, these are people that pay a lot of money every month, and uh, and and you, in, your job there is to give them what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, so the point is, when you go and work as a creative in house in 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 a, in a structure like that, you're working for the sales and marketing team. That's yeah. that's your boss. Okay, those yeah. are the people that do the research, come up and say, you know what, our our subscribers want, and they're right because the mm -hmm. subscriber pay you know eighty pounds, eighty bucks a month. 
and they, they deserve to get what they're paying for. And I must yeah. say, some of these companies are very, very good to do that. And frankly, Skies is an excellence in doing that. And uh, but that's that's the bottom line. If you're a creative person, that's you know that's your new boss. It's not yeah. your. But I was going to say, you know, the two biggest drivers of cost, and they're almost exactly the same in terms of quantum. If you look at what Netflix spends, are your your programming spend and your marketing budget. And I think what the UK uh, sort of isn't quite woken up to that with two powerhouses like the BBC and ITV and platforms like Channel 4 to basically create hits for you, to create fame just by sheer dint of their scale, they act as those marketing channels. And I don't think they've quite, although, you know, I think it does come into the equation, but because the programming budget or the production budget may not be equivalent to what Netflix is spending in general, are you creating a hit because no, of that? We, we, we had a good example of that during lockdown. We made a show called Quiz, which was a mini series for ITV, a very yeah. British thing. We, we did have a pre-sale to America, but uh, the, the window uh, that ITV gave as a marketing window yeah. is fantastic. I mean, we, we're now seeing that show around the world. <laughs> yeah. and I, I think you're right. One of the questions I have when now when we weigh up, who do we go with if we have competing? Yeah. I think it's not just about the rights or the money. It's how much marketing yeah. much weight behind this. Are you really, really going to believe in it? Because audience yeah. know if 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 Alex Ryder isn't on the front page of the Amazon Prime site, yeah. they don't care about it, and therefore they should. And and so that's really really important. Yeah, and there's just so much more space in a linear channel to do that than there is actually in an Xbox. You can have you know a few tiles. Yeah. We, we, we've had during during you you've obviously had a good COVID, um, uh, if I if I can say such a thing. It's terrible. You know, you, uh, what about Quibi? Because Quibi is something that, for those who don't know, was launched in the US just as uh, COVID broke out. It was a it was a really interesting idea, which was to take short form content subscription service, very high budget, very high budgets, retaining rights in in, in most of the cases. Mm -hmm great talent it hasn't landed with the effectiveness that the the founders expected i think that would be fair to say mm. and do we do we think that's because uh people aren't going into work and they they watch mm. content in that at home you want longer form content well, why why do we think it hasn't quite hit the ground running yeah i mean i think you could you could readily point as inherently a mobile proposition meant for short for shorter form uh, when not on a big screen. And then that market disappeared overnight. So uh, that's lousy and lousy timing for them. It uh, absolutely, and the reason it garnered so much attention is because it was genuinely, is genuinely a very innovative rights model, uh, you know, format, production duration, all of those things i think there were there's a lot of intrigue around it because was that a way in which everybody was used to working could that create you know just because it's chunked into 15 minutes could you then create an hour program that could then have a, yeah. another life somewhere else don't know and i have to i haven't watched anything on it at all so uh but i haven't you know as you say heard that there's a kind of amazing hit in there that would get me over there so I think it's it's been a it's been a tough launch period for them. No, no, we're getting some questions coming in, and unfortunately, believe it or not, we've only got another five minutes. And um, what one of the questions is: where partnerships with larger streaming services become the norm, will this negatively impact struggling independent film and TV productions companies? I suppose I mean who can't pay. I suppose the question is: actually, the large streaming services. What impact is that going to have on the smaller independent? How do we see the independent production sector developing over the next five years? It's been such a key driver, particularly in Britain, for creative entrepreneurship. At least, how do we see the, the sector developing over the next few years? Um, look, uh, what I can answer is probably from a more kind of a um, um, global perspective. I just think, I mean, inevitably, uh, Domestic markets for content are, you know, getting uh, more more challenging than ever, and um, even small um, production companies and uh, independent production companies have to think internationally and globally. Um, so my answer would be, 
if, if you're capable to do that step um, and you, you, you come from the UK that has an incredible, obviously, history and credibility in producing excellent content, then I think there's still a lot of space and actually global streamers uh, are a great opportunity for those companies because, look, frankly, uh, it means your product that you developed in, you know, in, in the north of the UK or in, you know, south of Wales could be watched, you know, from Indonesia to Mexico, and and that wasn't the case, frankly, you know, ten years ago. Um, but you need to adapt your thinking. I think you need to get out of the idea that uh, your all your objective is to get a development deal from BBC and ITV. With all due respect, I mean, it, it's a great, it's a great, you know um process but it cannot be the only process you know in, in, in the community you, you have to be willing to take some kind of risk um and and it's like it's, it's about ideas i mean look the, the, the fantastic thing that these um uh, platforms have showed is that a show from germany like think of dark okay um a show from italy a show from spain you know catholic hell can become a global show yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and that happens frankly because they are good shows, they are good shows. They, 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 you know, because people speak about it, because there is, you know, word of mouth, and and that's an incredible opportunity. And 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 yeah. we shouldn't see that as, um, as you know, independent. The independent environment shouldn't see that as a as a negative. They just should see it as a positive because it is a positive. Yeah. No, and I think I, I, the sentence in the name of this session had is what's the next UK ten years? It's by being distinctly British stories that earn their uh, place in the market rather than trying to create kind of some things that land sort of transatlantically or globally. And, you know, your examples quiz, even the bodyguard to an extent, you know, sort of uh, start as those really distinctive British stories by great British voices and then find their place. So I think don't get distracted about what you do best. I think I think that's a that's a brilliant way of ending the session, uh, Rima. Well, well, well done. Uh, we we are going to stick around if people have got questions for us. We're going to go into some virtual Q and A uh, session. But I'm going to hand over now to Janet and thank thank you both. Uh, well done, Rima. Thank you, thank you, Rima. <laughs> Masterful, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Rima, Andrea, and Wayne, for your improvisation and for sharing your insights into the business of television, the rights, the money, the marketing. So where will UK television be 10 years from now? It's a brilliant addition to a global, highly competitive market, increasingly streaming online, but it has a clear and distinctive proposition, which BritBox actually epitomizes a collaboration between ITV, BBC, Channel 4, launched November in the UK, already successful globally. So what's the culture needed to be successful in the next 10 years? Television in the UK and everywhere else needs to be open to challenge the status quo, to recognize that one model no longer fits, there must be new models, new ways of working, more collaboration. It's a dynamic, highly competitive marketplace. The UK is well positioned to take forward the opportunity it provides for international fame. Thanks so much to our panelists for taking us forward in this discussion. As they said, they will be available for Q&A from 11 o'clock for those of you in the audience who have festival priority passes. So do stick around. For others of you, now's the time to explore the Createch Virtual Expo. There's a session going on from 11 at the Createch Expo booth with three more Createch ones to watch, hosted by Carlos Grande, editor of the creativeindustries.co.uk. And the full list of the Createch 100 ones to watch will be accessible there. And only over 85 of those companies are also hosting their own virtual booths where you can meet them in person, find out more about what they do and how you can get involved. Look for the red ones to watch logo in the exhibitor listing. Do take a look. We'll be starting again on the Createx stage at 12 noon with a change of style and pace. Hosted by Nicola Mendelssohn, VPEMEA Facebook. 
one not to be missed. See you back here then. Thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.